pleasure to, at this meeting of the North Reading Historical Antiquarian Society, uh, that tonight uh, with us uh, is Bob Frischman from Andover, uh, who is uh, noted for his, uh, you might say, um, wonderful uh, enterprise, uh, belt, um, Beltheim, uh, where he has been uh, since 1992, has been a uh, restorer and repairer of antique timepieces, uh, has uh, sold uh, over 1,700 uh, antique vintage clocks, and is, has wrecked, lectured widely on clock making in America and, and, the, and the history of timepieces. Uh, he is a fellow of the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors and a freeman of the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers of London. And he has developed in recent years a particular interest of Rufus Porter, a Yankee um, inventor, uh, artist, and, uh, and, um, and artisan. And, and with tonight, we are delighted that he will be talking on Rufus Porter and many other aspects of American clock. And I'm delighted to hear that we'll also be hopefully hearing also about automobile clocks tonight, <laughs> <laughs> which sounds like great fun. Thank you, Bob. Okay, thank you. And thanks for having me. I certainly uh, uh, I can talk about many things uh, clock related, but you'll hear why, uh, why Rufus Porter is of particular interest to me. Let's see, I'll drift this way enough so that I get into the field. How are we doing? Yeah. It's right. good. It's got a little dark, but... All right. Very good. Well, that's probably better if it's dark, right? For uh, <laughs> not showing all my, uh, all my vanities. Great. Well, uh, I guess uh, you'll, you'll, you'll hear why I got interested in Rufus Porter as we go along, but he certainly... Uh, th there was a time in New England history uh, around the time of the Revolution and afterwards, when people like Rufus Porter really were important to America and to New England. They were itinerant uh, uh, artisans, uh, writers, poets, journalists, and they went around uh, getting ideas. And these weren't people that lived in Boston or New York and had fancy houses and were rich. These were New England kind of country people who just had a lots of good ideas and they shared them with their friends and they created kind of the whole uh, uh, New England inventiveness before about the Civil War when companies got bigger and uh, cities got bigger. Uh, New England really had a rich history of small towns where a lot of important things happened. So uh, th that's something to keep in mind as we think about uh, New England history and office and also about Rufus Porter. Just a little, and you don't have to uh, you don't have to spend a lot of time reading this, but just to see, he was born in 1792 in West Foxford. He's uh, very close to us. Uh, this is just his first family. He had a lot of kids with his uh, first wife who lived most of her life in Billerica, and he kind of came and went as he was doing his various enterprises and traveling around. But uh, yeah, I guess uh, that was typical too. Where there were large families and eventually if the first wife died there was a second one and that's on a second page I didn't put here. He, had a, he lived a long time and had a lot of kids. There's another Rufus Porter in the world, but I'm not talking about this one. Uh, sometimes when I eBay Rufus Porter just to see if stuff's around, uh, I end up with a lot of information about this football player who, uh, whose name uh, is the same, but I doubt that he's a close relative of, uh, of our Rufus Porter. Uh, Probably the first time I heard about Rufus Porter was when uh, I repaired a clock in another house in Andover, and they said, oh, we have Rufus Porter murals on the wall. And I, oh, that's interesting, I looked, but I really didn't pay much attention, but at least I remembered that this was probably 20 years ago that the name first came up, and this house still exists in Andover and still has Rufus Porter murals on the wall. And then uh, I'm kind of a journalist as well. I write about antique things, particularly clocks, but other things. And at Historic Deerfield, uh, they had a seminar about Yankee ingenuity. And they talked a lot about the kind of uh, men that I was describing. And Rufus Porter's name came up a lot. This is Philip Zay, who is the uh, director of uh, Historic Deerfield out there. And uh, this is the building that it took place in. I don't know how many of you have been there, but it's, a, it's kind of a little recreated town uh, with historic buildings in it. 
and this is a view of the main street too. Deerfield Academy is there, so there's a prep school kind of like the one in Andover. Uh, so it's a, it was a lovely place just to spend a weekend as well. But I ended up writing uh, an article in, uh, in an antiques uh, trade newspaper, Main Antique Digest, about Rufus Porter and that whole seminar that took place. So you can see my interest in Rufus Porter was starting to, uh, to blossom a little bit more. But the thing that most people know about Rufus Porter and have heard about him is his painting and the fact that still in New England there are houses, taverns, including ones around here, that have these great wall murals uh, that he would do. Uh, and also he traveled around and he did people's uh, portraits, their likenesses, which you see here. So he would come into town, he'd get a little ad in the loft, and so, you know, uh, certainly he's being recognized for what he does. And in uh, Rocks Village in Haverhill, uh, there was a house across the street from a clock repair customer of mine that's just full of Rufus Porter murals uh, downstairs and upstairs and up the stairway and everything. And my customer and friend was begging me to buy it because he loved to have me near him, but also to make sure that these were preserved. But uh, I didn't and couldn't. But uh, as far as I know, the people who moved in there now are not uh, tearing the walls down and uh, putting up a pine paneling or anything. They're, they're leaving the Rufus Porter stuff there. And also in Townsend, there's this uh, Reed family homestead that also has Rufus Porter intact murals still on the wall. And these are some of them. This is a view inside the house. So the thing that Rufus Porter emphasized was that um, if, if you wanted to decorate the walls of your house, you know, like this, one thing you could do is just paint them some color that wasn't very interesting, maybe put up a couple of cheap prints if you had them, or if you had more money, you would buy wallpaper. But wallpaper cost more than having Rufus Porter come in and decorate your walls uh, with paint. So that was kind of his marketing technique was saying, you know, this is kind of better than wallpaper and cheaper. So uh, here's, here's your option. So here's some close-ups, too. He had certain vignettes uh, that he included in a lot of his uh, murals, including uh, little steamboats on rivers. He, he ended up moving to Portland, Maine, uh, when he was a young man, spent time there, and then again was around New England. So some of these scenes are familiar from around here, including this one, which is a view of the observatory in Portland, Maine that's up on a hill, and this appears in, in a lot of his murals, and that observatory is still there. There's the, uh, the building, it's got a few more other buildings around it now, but uh, that observatory is there and you can visit it and go inside. So it's kind of nice to make the connection to the present day as well. The other thing he did is created these family registers. You know, he was an artist, uh, a printer, so uh, uh, down at the bottom, I guess we're just cutting it off. But uh, let's see, maybe we'll get a little closer and then we'll see that it says Rupert's Porter on the bottom. There we are. Okay. Yeah, but anyway, it's not, yeah, it's not vital. But anyway, uh, he created this family register and sold them blank and you would buy one and fill it in, fill it in as well. So, and so here's uh, the only known advertisement for the portrait likenesses that he would prepare. And there's the price list down there. So 20 cents, you know, you could get something. You could uh, uh, pay $3 or even $8 if you had it painted on ivory, which was the way that more expensive, uh, higher quality miniatures were done. So, uh, so this is again what he would create a little handbill and he could hand them out, distribute them, and people would, uh, would arrange to have their likeness done. And he used a little machine, a camera obscura, that made it pretty quick to trace out the profile of people and then he could fill in the details and the color. So there's uh, uh, even another one of his ads from 1821 that he published in Haverhill. And as you see, you know, if, uh, if uh, it doesn't look like you, you don't have to pay. I don't know how many arguments he got into, but probably there was no, for, there was no photography then, so it's not like you had an alternative of, uh, you know, of getting, uh, going down to the store and having your picture taken instead. So uh, I think people were happy to have a little likeness. And of course, you know, there was a lot of uh, early death then too. So people, so there's an example of the kind of machine he used. He, he actually invented his own version of this and he was an inventor as you will hear. But it's just the likeness comes in and kind of gets reflected and then you can trace it on there and then afterwards you can fill in the details. So they're good. So here's some examples too of his, uh, of his artwork and their profiles. 
usually, but you know, he, he clearly knew how to paint. This is no uh, stick figure amateur kind of thing with the color and all. And I'm guessing that uh, people were pretty happy with what they uh, with what they got. So again, an interesting hairstyle here, but the, that's uh, that's not unusual for the time. So these are again uh, some Rufus Porter likenesses, and this is the one that I brought today because I own a little miniature, a Rufus Porter original miniature. And this is the one that I have, and the uh, the person is identified as a little tiny history about him, and also uh, a label on the back saying who framed it and uh, sold the arranged for the painting. So there's another uh, another one of these little miniature paintings. They're just about four by six, maybe uh, little miniatures. Here's a couple more. So you're getting the idea. This one I like particularly because this is a this is a daguerreotype. This is the earliest style of photograph starting in about the 1840s. So what we have here is a daguerreotype, and both the woman, the widow, and the children are holding a Rufus Porter portrait of their deceased husband and father. So uh, this was a great thing to, to find, too, where uh, you have a kind of a picture of a picture, and uh, it's of a Rufus Porter, but it's also showing the way that these little likenesses were cherished and, and preserved because that was the way they they had to remember. So we're getting to the ramping up of my interest in this because uh, I go to these auctions at Skinner where they sell clocks and watches and things and I happen to notice that um, in, in the catalog and, and when I went to the auction itself I saw there was a clock, a grandfather clock, a tall clock uh, with Rufus Porter Bill Ricca on the dial. And uh, I said, boy, that's interesting. I didn't know that you know, Rufus Porter did anything with clocks, and very few people do know that. And in fact, this is the only known clock of Rufus Porter's. But, um, and it's not the kind of thing where somebody would fake this. You know, there would be no reason to put Rufus Porter's name on a grandfather clock. That wouldn't help its value at all. In fact, it might pe one, make people say, you know, that something's funny here, because this guy painted wall murals, so what's his name doing on a clock? But in fact, as you'll hear, this, uh, I believe this clock is actually by Rufus Porter and the only one known by Rufus Porter. And I bought it. Uh, it, it wasn't, uh, it, it didn't cost uh, the huge amount that I was afraid. One other guy was bidding and he quit before I did and I came home with the clock and I, and I now own it. So this is uh, uh, another view. The case is made out of cherry. Uh, which uh, sort of proves that it's an American clock, too. A lot of grandfather clocks like this are English, but, uh, but this is definitely American. Here you can see the uh, room at Skinner uh, down in Marlboro where these clock auctions uh, previews take place, and that's the uh, clock expert specialist that works for Skinner, and that's the way it kind of looks at auctions. You're not seeing my clock here, but there's usually rows of clocks lined up, and you can bid on them and take them home if you're the last guy with their with your hand in the air. So there's a, up there at the podium, they're selling a different clock in this case, but there's the auctioneer and the clock specialist sitting at the podium, just in case some of you have not been to auctions. That's kind of the flavor of what you see, and every clock goes by and gets sold. So there's a close-up view of the face or the dial of my clock. So again, you see it says Rufus Porter Bill Ricca. I don't think, uh, it's pretty clear that he did not paint that clock dial. That wasn't the kind of thing he did, that clock face. Though that's a typical type of uh, clock face that people bought from England and, uh, and, and attached to their clocks. But uh, his name was inscribed on there probably by him. So there's again a little uh, closer view of Rufus Porter, Bill Ricca. So I was just as much attracted by Bill Ricca as I was by Rufus Porter. Since I live in Andover, I said, oh great, here's a clock that was made just down the road from me. So that had kind of at that point equal appeal because I wasn't that interested or knowledgeable yet about Rufus Porter. The other thing is that, um, as I mentioned, Rufus Porter, a lot of his family, his first wife, lived in Bill Ricca for many, many years. And I discovered in Bill Ricca, I did a talk there about Rufus Porter, um, that in the cemetery, his wife is buried there and a couple of his kids. So there's the, uh, there's the headstone of Eunice Porter, his first wife, who died. Uh, and Rufus Porter lived about another 40 years after, uh, after Eunice passed away. So there's the Rufus Porter clock in my shop, uh, getting ready for me to look at. For a while I just put it there, I looked at it, I, I wasn't sure what I was going to find inside, you know, if, some, if once I had grandfather clock movement from that time period. There were 
there were unique kind of aspects about it that made me think maybe this is something special and maybe it's a Rufus Porter clock in some interesting way because I already was starting to learn that he was an inventor, not just a, an artist. So a couple of the little things. You, no one has ever seen these little square cutouts like that before. There are, sometimes there's other kinds of cutouts because clockmakers were trying to save brass. Brass was expensive. So if you cut that piece away where you didn't need it, you could use that little piece of brass for something else. But never that kind of square opening like that. And there's a couple other subtle things here, too, that, that uh, make it seem like it's different. Uh, this, again, is a, is a look at the front of the movement, that uh, just so you kind of know what I was looking at when I was exploring it, and there are the parts taken apart. These pretty much look like what you see in every grandfather clock from that period, and if any of you were at my talk a few years ago here, <coughs> we talked more about how these work and, and what's inside of these, of these clock movements. But the thing, there were some particularly unusual things and things that said, this is not a standard clock from England or from America. Somebody did something, some special things with it. And these little bevels here on this thing called the snail, those nobody has seen before. And it's kind of subtle, but it allows you to turn the hands backwards without breaking anything. So it was kind of uh, innovative. There's other ways to do that. But the other reason we know that this is probably something that he or a local clockmaker made with him was the fact that there's these casting occlusions or holes because any finished part that came from an English clockmaking firm would never have had those kinds of holes in that tube. It would be solid and look more professional. So we see that. And then I discovered that Rufus Porter did have a patent. This is from a book of clock and watch patents. And we see R. Porter in 1832, Bill Rick of Mass, uh, registered a patent that had something to do with the striking system of the clock, which is what that piece uh, referred to that I was showing you, that allows you to set the hands backwards. That's part of the striking system that goes ding, ding uh, on every hour. So I said, maybe this, my clock, illustrates what the patent is. Because the problem is, is that the patent office burnt down four years later. So this was the U.S. Patent Office. In, the, in 1836, there was a fire, and everything basically was destroyed. So we don't know what Rufus Porter's patent was, or what most patents were that predate 1836. The weird thing is that in 1877, the place burnt up again. So you think, you know, they would have had a bucket of water by the door, maybe, to uh, keep this from happening. So a lot of other stuff got burnt up from those years, too, so we lost other uh, materials, including models, because at that time, if you had a patent, you actually had to create a little model of it, and they kept those at the patent office, and a lot of those got burnt up. So anyway, so I thought, aha, I've got the Rufus Porter patent material here. This must be what his patent was about. Unfortunately, a friend of mine found an early newspaper from, I think, 1830-something, uh, which talked about the Rufus Porter patent. It's the only known other information about his patent. And it had nothing to do with what my clock is. <laughs> it was a method, in fact, kind of an ingenious one, for an alarm thing where actually if you set the alarm for a certain time, at that time, a little arm would swing around and strike a match and light a candle so that you could uh, do that. Uh, and again, this is, so 1832, he thought of this, and that was his patent. The funny thing is, uh, so there's uh, the close-up. It's a little fuzzy. But uh, this described how, you know, the magic matches and the match and the turn lights a candle. So that, at least according to this newspaper, that was the basis of his patent. And lo and behold, about 40 years later, a similar clock appeared that was made by one of the big Connecticut clock companies. So you can see the arrangement up at the top, where when you set the alarm with this little disc, it triggers it, and the little match swings around and lights the candle. The problem was, if you don't hold that match in there pretty tight, you fire a lit match across the room, and uh, hopefully it doesn't land on the curtains and uh, burn your house down. So, uh, so, but this is kind of an instance, and you'll hear a lot more about this, of Rufus Porter kind of inventing things way before anybody else did. And maybe they, other people heard of it, or maybe just people had to think of it a second time. Because no one's ever found the Rufus Porter clock that, that does this. Uh, maybe there wasn't one even, but uh, there certainly was a model of it. The other thing is, when I look closely on here, we see little initials here. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy when you're stamping, uh, you're stamping your, uh, your initials on something and you've made the little punch. 
uh, to do it backwards because you know you're doing it in reverse and if you get confused for a minute you end up stamping the letters backwards so I'm pretty sure that PR is actually Rufus Porter's initials stamped into the clock so uh, the, the thing there's another close-up of it the thing is there are no other clockmakers from that time in this area whose initials were PR the only other one was Paul Rogers up in Maine, and he made totally different clocks, and he didn't have a stamp like this. So I'm pretty sure that's who it was. So, and also, when I looked at the letters, they looked like one of the only few known actual signatures of Rufus Porter. This is from a wall mural, but the R and the P looks very much like the stamp uh, that I have on my movement. The only other PR we know from that time, Paul Revere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you can see it doesn't look like it. Paul Revere doesn't, didn't make clocks, and, uh, and I don't think my clock was made by Paul Revere. <laughs> so that's good. So here's just another couple of views of it. A few other unique things are the shape of these pillars in between there. No one's seen that before. Usually they just have a different shape. So there, again, there's some odd things about it that tell me that Rufus Porter had a hand in there. And the fact that those pillars actually screw in there. That's very unusual, but it makes the whole thing much tighter. So that, and, and there are a few instances of clocks in England that are like that. So, you know, I think, again, he had an interesting idea to improve things, and other people did it too, probably just came up with the same idea. So Rufus Porter was a very prolific inventor. He had more than 20 patents, that he, and, and they were all mechanical. They had nothing to do with art. They were uh, mechanical inventions, and this was one from 1840, where this was a fire alarm, so it's got some kind of clockwork stuff uh, uh, worked into it, so he definitely was interested in clockwork things and, and in doing them that way. So, uh, the thing, one of the key things that Rufus Porter did, he was a journalist and a publisher, and he actually founded this newspaper in, uh, in New York City, The American Mechanic, and in it, he would uh, focus on inventions of him and other people. So you can see there's that same piece that you just saw the patent of, and then list all kinds of patents, inventions, have news re relating to mechanical inventions. So he was starting and maybe continuing this notion of these small-time inventors that shared information and were trying to develop all these labor-saving, interesting things, kind of everybody was thinking about how to do things faster and easier and make some money at the same time. So there's the American mechanic. This is uh, uh, one of his patents, uh, patent uh, records actually. You can see Rufus Porter fire alarm. That's actually the document that went along with that drawing that we saw a minute ago. There's the second page of it. And you see one of the people uh, witnessing it is, is Stephen L. Porter, one of his sons who worked with him for many years. So here's another one of his inventions. It's kind of a plumb level thing where if you tilt it, you can see what the angle is. You see plumb and level indicator. So uh, I've seen a couple of examples of these. I could have bought one for $5,000, but wasn't sure it was a, a wise uh, thing for me to spend money on. But another invention of his, and they actually have this at Deer, Historic Deerfield, which you uh, saw a few minutes ago. This is a corn sheller. So you crank that and you put the, uh, put the corn uh, cob in there and it takes the corn off. They were, um, it takes the kernels off. There were different versions of these. He wasn't the only guy to invent a mechanical corn shiller. In fact, they use them now. There's nobody sitting there next to the cornfield cutting, cutting it off by hand. But this was an early machine that did just that kind of thing. There's uh, the sheet from Historic Deerfield that describes it. Uh, uh, as, as an invention, and, um, and some of them obviously were made. There's more than the one in Historic Deerfield. But the other thing he did is that he, uh, he, he, went, he wrote several books, but this one is all about doing all kinds of stuff in your house, mechanical things, artistic things, and I have a reprint of it here that you can look at because it's just, it, it actually was a bestseller at the time. This one is 1826. So there's the first edition in 1826. There's uh, second, uh, second edition, still 1826, so it was so popular. Third edition, we're still in 1826. So uh, this was a popular book that people were buying in order to learn landscape painting on walls or rooms. So he's instructing people on how to do uh, what he does, giving them the step-by-step -step 
of uh, how to do it. So here's the table of contents. You can see all the kinds of kind of crazy, interesting stuff, how to make different colored ink, how to wash brass or copper, so it goes on how to restore old writing. So all these little, some are almost magic tricks in a way, but all stuff that actually is real and works, you know, he wasn't making this, making this stuff up. So even right, so this is what the book, a couple of the pages look like, paint a picture that will appear and disappear. So it's fascinating reading because, again, this was real stuff that was, that was happening in these. So there's fun here too, 89, to change the colors of animals, freeze water in warm weather, make a person's face appear luminous in the dark. So I think everybody should buy this book and, you know, <laughs> and learn some, uh, some interesting things to do in your spare time. So, uh, and there's the, uh, another page too, just showing how to do like gold leafing as well. The, um, I, I have seen an original of this book at the American Antiquarian Society that's in Worcester, a great place that has you know, huge amounts of paper from before the Civil War, mostly relating to New England, but America as well. So this original there, that's what the building looks like. And that's where I was able to read his newspaper the American Mechanic, because they have, it was only published a, a year uh, before somebody bought it and changed it and eventually, and closed it, ruined it, but, uh, but I wasn't looking at microfilm there or online, I was actually reading the paper. You could, they brought it out to me and I could flip through page after page and have fun looking, looking at the actual paper. So there was the, the first edition with Rufus Porter as the editor, and he's describing why he's doing this and all the things he hopes to accomplish doing it. They also helped other people file their patent applications to get patents. So he worked with his partner, and they said, you know, you can, uh, uh, they, they'd make the patent models for you, they'd help you fill out the, uh, the application, and uh, that was part of the service that they did there. And they also, this is a list of the places that sold their newspaper, and, you know, somewhere around here in Lowell and Worcester, where you could buy copies of the American Mechanic. So here's a few more pages of it, too. Again, you know, you're not going to read every word, but I, I really had to tear myself away because, you know, everything was interesting in some way. And there's another one of his uh, inventions up top there, which was actually this field engine. Uh, that he designed for uh, to help uh, with uh, farming that would uh, make it make make the work easier. And there you can see uh, another one from his newspaper. And the thing that appealed to me too is he had advertisements in his paper. That's how he made money, uh, or tried to. So when I could see a watch and clock making uh, advertisement, that was sort of a bonus to uh, to really be able to find that. And this was a, a Boston. Uh, mm -hmm. place that were that sold and repaired clocks and watches and other related things and there was even an ad for this uh, William Johnson clockmaker in New York City that shows uh, uh, what he did there and here's an example of a William Johnson clock that just was at a recent auction too so uh, and it has the label inside it's pretty clear that it was uh, a clock that William Johnson made and sold in his place in New York City in almost every issue too there was this ad for a great place uh, uh, where you could get lunch and dinner. So, you know, I was getting pretty hungry as I was going along and reading about all the <laughs> kinds of things that you could, uh, you could get at this, uh, at this eatery in New York City there at, at Pattinson's. So uh, it's fun just to see that kind of stuff too. So he also, uh, like other newspapers at the time, talked about ships that were arriving in, in, uh, in New York or in Boston and, you know, what was important about them. The good thing about this, among the passengers, Charles Dickens. Oh, this is uh, indicating the, yeah. telling about the arrival of Charles Dickens in this country when he came and did big lecture tours all around the country. So that was kind of a nice find too, that uh, there's a little, you know, first-hand uh, report on Charles Dickens arriving too. And then there's these little cautionary tales too, because, you know, again, he's trying to make this an important newspaper so he's basically saying, you know, a guy who was well-dressed came into a jewelry store and says, hey, I like that gold watch, can I go show it to my friend to make sure that it's a good one? And he, oh yeah, sure, and he gave it to him and the guy left and never came back. So, you know, he's saying don't be fooled by somebody who's well-dressed. You know, you wouldn't give it to somebody, you know, in dirty, tattered clothes, so keep it in mind. So that was uh, a kind of funny thing too to see. So, and one thing, and you'll hear a little bit more about that, he was interested in balloons as or a lot of people then, uh, because that was the only way you could fly. You could get up in the air in those days. There were no airplanes. The balloon is what could 
take you up if you wanted to. So uh, even had hints for uh, planting gardens. This is uh, showing all kinds of flowers and plants and how to design a nice, uh, a nice garden setting in your house too. And he always, he would run series on various mechanical things. In this case, you see it's about cams. So week after week, he'd tell more and more sort of mechanical, scientific things. Very specific. useful for all the young inventors that were trying to think up uh, new things that would make them famous or make them some money. And this, uh, here's another, you know, they, every week they would list these, uh, the patents and what they did, just so you could keep track of it. And this is a close-up of that. And they even, there was an entry again that was related to clocks and watches about uh, a pendulum uh, that they could do, additional expense of only 10 cents. Because that's a problem with pendulum clocks, is if it gets cold or hot, they get, go slow or fast. So you needed to compensate for that a little bit if you could. And again, another uh, copy showing his, uh, his uh, little machine for actually moving a house by horsepower. So, and then eventually he was leaving, and here's a message from him saying that he's moving on, he's selling the business, uh, but he's still uh, showing some other things. Here's a boat to sail against the wind. Uh, I don't think this was a particularly successful invention because if you think about it, you really, you know, <laughs> you're using as much energy as you're getting, so you probably aren't going too far. But uh, it was an interesting concept too, and um, and this was somewhat just a little local history. This was about Lowell, and and you know at the Lowell textile mills, the you know business came and went, and when the business got slow, they laid off people. And he's really saying, you know, why do the poor laborers have to bear all the burden? How about if the bosses, you know, uh, cut their uh, income a little bit uh, or cut the dividends and let these people uh, share more in the in the profits? So he's uh, he was uh, uh, he was active in that way too. They talked about it. Here's a little mention of the old man in the mountain too. Just a little uh, sort of travel guide description. As we know, uh, that's not uh, there anymore. Uh, the part of the old man fell off. So we can't see him. So here we have another uh, view of a horsepower yeah. boat. So uh, again, he, now he's talking about how he's going to sell the business. This, uh, but the key thing is that, so he sold that business, and a few years later, he was the founder of Scientific American magazine, which still exists and is still extremely important in this country. So if you look back, you know, one of the key things about Rufus Porter that isn't known, again, he wasn't just the guy painting walls and helping you not have to spend money on wallpaper. He actually founded one of the most important science, uh, popular science magazines in the country. So here's the first edition of Scientific American. If you look at it, it looks a lot like his American Mechanic newspaper, and it really was based on the same format. Uh, but he, he kind of restarted the process, eventually sold it. Here he is saying, you know, why he's starting it and the important work he's going to do. So here's the pages uh, of the first issue that look similar. Here they're trying, they're selling a book about the American Revolution and George Washington. But here we are back to balloons again because this is getting uh, more important. So here's this idea about observation balloons, keeping them up there. But he went a step further. This was the time of the gold rush, and he said, Actually, the quick way to get to the California gold fields is on this Zeppelin, essentially, that he, this blimp that he's designed. Because at that time, balloons were just balloons. They went up in the air, and if the wind was blowing west, that's the way you went. So you needed powered flight of some kind. So he had the idea of motorizing a balloon, basically, so you can go in the direction you want to go in. And he had the idea, way before anybody else, of having these kinds of blimps. So this was actually, you know, steam powered and with a big uh, salon down below and basically saying, you know, you could get to California in a few days on this instead of taking six months to go down to Panama and walk across mm -hmm. and get malaria and then go back up at the west coast or go all the way around the Horn. Uh, and, but he spent 40 years trying to convince people that this was a good idea. He even made a 20-foot working model that was demonstrated to the, uh, the Congress and uh, uh, he never got any the selling shares in the company, trying to uh, get people interested. So we're just going to see a few more pictures of uh, of his of his uh, thing. Here's a, uh, a stock certificate. He was selling them for five bucks each, still trying to raise money to promote the idea. So uh, here's Rufus Porter again, the aerial steamer, the flying ship again. He he claims he had the idea in the 1820s 
when he was trying to think of a way to rescue Napoleon from <laughs> exile. So he said, the best way, you know, you come in with a balloon, you lift them off, and you go, and nobody can catch you. So, uh, uh, but he kept this idea, for, again, for almost the rest of his life, trying to make it work. He even produced a little newspaper about that called The Aerial Reporter that talked about his progress in, uh, in trying to design and get it funded. But uh, it actually did appear in a popular print of the time, Again, during the gold rush, saying the way that people were trying to figure out how to get to California fast before all the gold was gone. So, and here's the Rufus Porter uh, uh, blimp up here in the top that's heading, uh, heading to California. Other people you see jumping in, there's a guy on a little rocket-powered sled there. So, uh, again, it's, it's a satire, but uh, they into the satire got worked Rufus Porter's blimp. Obviously, the idea eventually became uh, real. And here's an example of uh, a blimp that was uh, part of the, uh, U the United States military. We had many blimps at one time. And of course, there's the famous one, too, that uh, uh, had, a, had a, a little problem at, uh, in New Jersey when it was landing. But here, as it was flying around before, it caught fire and burnt up. Uh, that's what the Hindenburg looks like. And the reason I have a picture of Edgar Allan Poe in here is that uh, he uh, he promoted a giant hoax uh, by printing a long article in the Sun uh, about supposedly a group of Frenchmen that flew to America from France in a powered balloon. Oh. So we're thinking that he probably caught wind of Rufus Porter's idea at some point, and he, he did it as fact. He was claiming people were mobbing the, the newspaper. They uh, had to put out extra editions and all because people were reading and reading about this unbelievable uh, feat of flying across the Atlantic in anything, let alone, a, uh, let alone a balloon. And there's an illustration from the newspaper that shows uh, you know, what Edgar Allan Poe was claiming was the, uh, was the blimp that took people across. So, you know, eventually, uh, they had to admit it was a hoax and it didn't happen. So here's a few more uh, images of Rufus Porter again. So we see a steam carriage. So this is, again, before cars, way before Henry Ford, way before any other kind of powered uh, road vehicle. We see, you know, that he's designed a carriage with a steam engine that goes along the road. So, and of course, eventually, Stanley steamers existed, and the steam car was uh, a major competitor with gasoline-powered cars for many years. So in case you ever wanted to know what was under the hood of a Stanley steamer, uh, it's like a big uh, lobster pot, right, with uh, <laughs> making steam that uh, eventually drives your car. So another one of his inventions, the uh, elevated railroad. So way before anybody was thinking of doing this, he thought of getting the trains up off the streets. Uh, and as you can see, that idea actually happened uh, probably uh, 60 or 70 years after his uh, invention. It was a floating dry dock, which he invented. So there's, uh, again, this is the patent information. In 1835, he invented the floating dry dock. There's a, you know, the right side view of it, so you kind of see how it's supposed to work. And lo and behold, uh, you know, a century later, the United States Navy has uh, what looks almost just like the Rufus Porter drawing of a floating dry dock. So here's a rotary plow again. You're starting to get the idea of the way Rufus Porter's inventions looked when they were joined. So there's the rotary plow, and then there's, uh, you know, the modern equivalent of discs that cut up, the, cut up the ground, you know, a lot easier than dragging some wedge or spike through the, through the, through the ground. This one I wasn't so sure about, you know, i not sure how it would work. It looks pretty complicated. You know, the best I could do was, you know, this kind of rowing contraption that has some things that, uh, that maybe wiggle and flex, but uh, uh, I wasn't as impressed with that rowing machine. But there is an example of his perpetual almanac at the Antiquarian Society in Worcester, uh, where this was a little thing where you could turn dials and it would tell you calendar information for the next 8,000 years. Wow. And there was instructions on it to tell you how it worked. There was a little advertisement for it that, uh, you know, where people had a parlor ornament or a counting house manual. So if you needed to look ahead and know the calendar in coming years, you could use this little revolving almanac. 
he really didn't start that. This is a clock from the 1400s in Europe that also has all kinds of uh, calendar indications going way into the future. But he designed, you know, a nice little portable way of using it. Of course, now we just uh, put in a turn on our computers and we can see, yeah. you know, if uh, March 2nd of 2073 is a Tuesday or not. But, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's today. So here's another great thing. And I, I've seen these. These are little canes that open up and turn into a little chair. Right. So uh, th these are around. But he, he thought of it in 1854. And as well as this great life preserver, it's sort of like a rubber suit you put on. And, you know, it's full of air, so you can't drown if you fall in. Maybe you wish you did drown if you're in this <laughs> big rubber thing just splashing around. Uh, and this is one of my favorites too. This is the bullet engine, where he's essentially created a revolver or a you know a machine gun kind of thing way before others did too. There's the equivalent, basically the Gatling gun that came 40 years later, uh, using the same kind of principle. Even and my friends and I had fun even because uh, we like to drink porters. So they oh Rufus Porter Porter, you know maybe we ought to have a beer company. So, uh, so we went a step further and we figured we could have all these different kinds of beers named after his inventions and uh, picture his inventions on the bottle. So we've only, uh, we're only at the concept stage now, but, uh, but we're having fun with it. The other thing, you, so you saw that bullet engine, which is essentially a revolver. This is a model of Colt's invention of the revolver, except Colt bought the revolver patent from Rufus Porter for $100. On that, I don't know if he intended ever to be a gun manufacturer or not, but this is the label that goes along with that that's down at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford in that exhibit, and they, the Colt family paid for a lot of that museum there. So here's the whole thing about Samuel Colt and how great he was and an inventor and everything. Not a word about Rufus Porter and how he bought the patent for 100 bucks from Rufus Porter. And there's the, one, the early picture of the Colt manufacturing factory where they made these guns. And, you know, I suppose this could have been, you know, the Porter uh, revolver works if he'd, uh, if he'd work. But he never had enough money to, um, to, to produce most of the things that he made. And he was always looking for partners, always saying, you know, I'll share, you know, 50%, 75% of anything we make. If you manufacture the patent, you know, let's, let's partner up and do it. And just most of the stuff, either people just stole the patents or he sold them for small amounts. Uh, and he never became an industrialist like, like Samuel Colt did. But he did help found this Inventors Institute to try, it's like the modern version of these incubator facilities in cities where they use old mill space and let people come in and work on inventions. So this was kind of 150 years before that. Uh, he did help found this Inventors Institute that helped inventors move along. So we're getting near the end. This is uh, just as we approach the end of Rufus Porter's life. Here's uh, his son describing how in 1880 when Rufus was 89, wow. he's still doing stuff. He's going out digging clams. He's getting ready for a new, and working on a new clothes dryer. Uh, he's still working down in the basement. So uh, uh, he's quite a guy, even into uh, advanced old age. And the sad thing, too, here's the report. So at the end of his life, not many people remembered him or knew that he was there. But we're trying to change that now, and that's part of the reason I'm, uh, I'm with you tonight, too. So there. Beginning with uh, this book, that it's about 30 years old now, Gene Lipman, a historian, uh, came out with a book about Rufus Porter and talked about a lot of the houses that his paintings are in, but also about his inventions. So she started, kind of started the resurgence of interest in Rufus Porter. More recently, there was a, a book by a couple of women about um, the, the murals and his and others that uh, derive from his work. So there's a little more indication of him getting uh, more popular. There's even this book of poetry by a well-known American poet, uh, Wesley McNair, and he has two poems in there about Rufus Porter. He was uh, attracted to Rufus <coughs> Porter, and that's Wesley McNair, the poet. And by God, we've got a banjo clock in the picture, so I thought that was a perfect picture to show of Wesley McNair. So here's one of the poems, and he's uh, talking about, uh, he's kind of, 
channeling Rufus Porter like I'm trying to do here too and think about Rufus Porter's early life and how it led to the things that he did later. And there's uh, the second poem in there too. And he's actually, uh, the poet has dedicated this poem to Gene Lippman, the author of the book that I just mentioned, uh, that again talks about uh, maybe kind of uh, speak in the voice of Rufus Porter as he's thinking about things. So again, I won't uh, read the poem. But, and there was an exhibit in 1980 uh, about Rufus Porter at the Hudson River Museum, so things uh, were starting to heat, heat up even then. And one of the most famous collectors of American uh, New England antiques was Nina Fletcher Little. And she, uh, uh, and she really kind of put Amer uh, New England and American folk art on the, uh, 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 elevated it to the level that it deserved. She was a major collector. That's her husband, Bert Little, too. Uh, their house is still uh, over in Ipswich that you can visit. So, uh, and she collected Rufus Porter things. And here's a page from the auction after she had died when a lot of her things were sold off. And you can see one of the lots were several things of Rufus Porter's, including that revolving almanac we looked at, that plumb and level indicator that we looked at, as well as some, uh, some other things that, uh, that were sold. I wasn't tuned into this then. I didn't go to the auction. I didn't, I didn't buy that stuff. But, uh, but this showed, again, some growing interest in Rufus Porter material. Uh, and this was one of the things that uh, Nina Fletcher Little owned, and it was in that auction, too. It's a little, and that's her notes. She always had these little kind of jelly jar labels on, uh, on things of hers, and that was her note saying that this was a Rufus Porter likeness. You can see it's not a profile this time. No. So it's a little rarer because it was, I'm sure, just drawn by hand, uh, not a profile that he kind of filled in uh, material on. And of course, there now is a Rufus Porter Museum up in Bridgeton, Maine. I'm going to be speaking there this summer. And uh, it's just moving, too. They actually are moving the building. Uh, and there's the sign. You can see, and by God, you know, they have that Rufus Porter invention of the horse-powered mover. That's not how they moved the house, but they're, uh, but they're showing that Rufus Porter had the idea about moving houses uh, and could have helped them. And perhaps most promising is this is the Bowdoin College Museum of Art up in Maine, and uh, they plan in 2019 to have an exhibit on Rufus Porter on many aspects, not just the art, and they're even going to borrow my clock and have that in the exhibit. So I've gotten to know them, and I'm kind of keeping up with the progress of the exhibit that's coming along. But just to digress for a second, since you're here, this is the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston now. It's a different art museum, but uh, I'm uh, organizing a major symposium there in the fall where I'm going to look at a thousand years or more of art that has clocks and watches in it. So you're all uh, welcome to sign up for, for that. It's coming, and I have world-famous art history people who are coming to talk about paintings that, uh, in their areas of expertise, but these paintings all have clocks and watches in them. No one's ever done a conference on this before, and uh, it's been, that's been an interest of mine much longer even than Rufus Porter. So I'll be, uh, uh, I'll be running that in October. But our final image, again, is uh, Rufus Porter. So uh, we can look at him, think about him, and uh, I hope that uh, he's listening somewhere and that I've uh, gotten you more interested in Rufus Porter, too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Of course, we can uh, chat more, but uh, we can do it either as questions or just or chat. dollars well. each, but... Uh, <laughs> But the, uh, that's the second one. The first one is... <clears throat> if you're not very far, you're only here in Andover. I'm in Andover, yeah. So that's me. I've got a few things I'd like to talk to you about. Okay, well, I, uh, that's clocks are my favorite. I've got a couple pictures of clocks. Okay. But, uh, mm -hmm. Sure, well, clocks are my favorite subject. I yeah, can talk uh, about those all night. And I've done watch repair, too. And I've done oh, good. Loads of watches and pots and stuff like that that I'd like to find out about. Sure, uh, I'm happy to help you, and I work with auction houses too. So if there are things you want to sell, I know how to make sure you get as much as you can for them too. Very good. So, all right, that's great. Yes, sir. Of all of all the many patents you showed pictures of, from uh, Zeppelin type to moving houses, or some of the more practical ones. Yes. Were there were there other contemporaries who may have thought of similar things, or was he a true 
innovator where that was his mind's creation. And, and I'm yeah. not, not questioning forgery, I'm just saying, uh -huh. you know, two people thinking of inventing a plane at the same time, you know, a few days off, but was, were, yeah. those, were most of those patents, patents truly, like, unforeseen? Um, it's hard to say because, again, it really was kind of a bubbling pot at that time where everybody was having a lot of great ideas and, you know, if you're already looking at the patent numbers on those documents, you know, we're in the tens, the hundreds of thousands already. So people are patenting everything. So and it's a fair question that, you know, we happen to be focusing on him, but maybe there were 5,000 other Rufus Porters that were also, you know, drawing and thinking up things and everything too. But I tend to think that he was a visionary, really, an extremely active mechanical uh, mind and thought up a lot of stuff that was unique then and only later in many cases was applied in a practical way. But, you know, that time certainly, especially in New England, you know, every farmer was, you know, wrapping baling wire, you know, counterclockwise instead. Oh my God, I've got a great new idea here. You know, so everybody was trying to think about it. And partly it was really economics because there was always a labor shortage and labor was expensive in America. You know, in Europe, you know, you'd hire somebody for five cents a week and they were happy to get the work. Well, he moved to Kansas or Ohio, you know, this was the land of opportunity and nobody was going to silently suffer. You know, they were going to, so, you know, you had to not only pay your workers more, but you always were thinking about ways to do things faster, cheaper, and by machine rather than by, by human hand. And that's kind of a big story of the American clock and watch industry, too, because the Swiss are over there, you know, sitting in their dark, cold houses making every watch part by hand, and most of them lousy. And, you know, the Americans invented these machines that would spit out the same part, you know, 10,000 little screws a day, where some guy in Switzerland is making, you know, 10 screws a day. So uh, that, that really drove the American Industrial Revolution, and it was guys like Rufus Porter that were planting the seed for that so that the later people that started the clock companies and the watch companies and the armories and all the other factories that made pots and pencils and everything, you know, they, they weren't going to sit there and whittle a pencil one at a time. And they said, hey, let's figure out how to do this smart and fast. And Rufus Porter, Porter was part of that whole milieu, but I think he was uh, <coughs> a, a very good example of it and probably uh, uh, you know, better than most as far as thinking things up and then being able to act on it too with all these patents, even though a lot of them burnt up. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I think I think Rufus is, uh, Porter is not quite unique, but he is—he's one of a very handful of, of you know, of, of really of stars who, who, who had this whole broad range. I mean, he just wasn't. There were a lot of individuals who thought about one particular item or one particular industry, but he had—he had a very broad concept. The only other person I can think of that comes anywhere near close to him is Oliver Evans down in the Mid-Atlantic, who mm -hmm. is kind of the father of the automated flour mill and yes. a few other things, and came up with and he came up with some crazy steam-powered vehicles and other things of the same period. But yeah. there were very there are very few others that had this this wide range of. I mean, he was kind of almost like a. Uh, uh, you know, New England's own Leonardo da Vinci yeah. when it comes to yeah. invention. And yeah, the inventing. Renaissance man yeah. applies yeah. to him even though it was maybe the American Renaissance. Yeah. Yeah.